Unmuted. Yeah, apologies for the technical difficulties. I was happily clicking away, not realizing that you all weren't seeing my slide. So, um, so I was saying that um, uh, when I, in the research for the um, missing class book, um, uh, that I got to hear activists of all classes raising their their concerns, their complaints about their activist groups, um, and I found that their solutions varied a lot by by class. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of the um, research that went into this book um, before I tell you some of what I found about the activist class culture differences. So um, I studied 25 really varied progressive um, social movement organizations in five states. Um, they varied by the issue and how long-standing a group they were. And um, what we did was observe um, meetings um, that they were having anyway, and then um, gave out surveys, asked a lot of questions about themselves at the meetings, and asked if people wanted to be interviewed, and did 61 interviews. So the, the 362 uh, meeting participants um, who answered the survey were um, diverse by race and national origin and gender. And of course, the tricky thing, since I wanted to do cross-class comparisons, was that they needed to be um, very carefully categorized by class. So um, from their surveys, I knew their parents' uh, education and occupation or other income source, and I could figure out their class background from that and other questions. And then I knew their occupation and education level, um, so I could define their current class. And most of them fell clearly into one of these four class trajectory categories. Um, lifelong in the working class range from poor to lower middle class, and then um, uh, lifelong in the professional middle class, um, second generation college educated people, then the upwardly mobile straddlers, first generation to go to college and become, get into professional managerial careers, and voluntarily downwardly mobile. And children of college graduate um, professionals who went to college and then have made choices to, um, in most cases, be activists instead of pursuing income and um, professional careers. So those last three trajectories in this presentation I'm going to shorthand as the three college-educated trajectories. So they're, they're college grads um, of uh, very class backgrounds and very current, um, current class. So when I had these categories, I had um, I could uh, correlate class with any number of things. I, cor I tried out hundreds of, th of um, possible correlations, and it was amazing how many things correlated with class. More things correlated with class than with race, gender, generation, or um, type of movement group. Um, the sum of how th why things are done differently in different classes is because there's different movement traditions. So um, the uh, working class majority groups in the study were either community organizing groups um, or they were um, labor initiated, um, things run by unions. Um, and the um, college educated majority groups were either nonprofits that were doing staff, mostly anti-poverty uh, advocacy, or what's sometimes called new social movement groups, um, but what the groups called themselves was progressive or anti-imperialist. And then um, the majority uh, voluntarily downwardly mobile groups were anarchist groups. So some of why things were done differently and there were different approaches to problems was different traditions in these different movement, you know, these different uh, movement roots, tradi movement traditions that come from different parts of history. So um, the first thing about activists of different classes is how do people become activists? And there's two really distinct paths. And all my generalizations, of course, are going to be over generalizations. I'm not talking about every single activist of each class. Mm -hmm. but by and large, most of the working class and poor activists um, in the study um, already shared a context before becoming active because um, the workplace was the site of the organizing or the neighborhood or just being affected by a um, particular issue, um, like an environmental justice group, everybody being uh, poisoned by the same toxins. 
And um, both when that was true of sharing a context or um, when it wasn't, when somebody just joined um, because of a cause, working class and poor people tended to join groups as a cluster with family members, um, grown children, siblings, spouses, um, extended family, um, or friends. And um, a number joined through a relationship with a professional. So is there a community college? There's no volume? I see myself there. You sound great. I'm hearing that not everyone's hearing me. No, we hear Boy, you technology. Fine. Betsy, we hear you fine. With it. You can't do that. We're good? OK. No, we hear you fine. Betsy, we hear you fine. OK, good. Um, so um, uh, sometimes people's community college teachers who are activists would invite um, people into a, uh, working class people into a community group or um, clergy, social workers. Um, so the, the, the thing that all these uh, working class paths to activism have in common is there's pre-existing relationships um, and there's um, relationships that are primary or come uh, first with people before the particular group or, or cause. Um, oops, I'm frozen again. Um, okay. Well, I can keep talking, but you all can't see the. Um, you want to go click click on this? Oh no, it's not. I'm not moving in. It's not moving. Oh, okay, got it. Apologies for the technical troubles. I guess I'm an amateur webinar speaker. Um, so by contrast. Most college-educated activists um, made a commitment to an issue um, that they had learned about or an ideology, an idea first, and then went seeking a group through which they could express their concern about that um, issue or ideology. And so the vast majority of college-educated activists had joined their groups as individuals, sometimes a little group of peer friends, almost never family members. So one of the common problems um, that activists of all classes raised was, where is everybody? Low turnout, people um, uh, not coming back, um, not turning out for things. So recruitment, how do you recruit? And we asked that in the interview um, protocol. We had a question of, if um, more people were going to join um, this group, what would get them to join? And um, so. Uh, it's almost universal wanting to recruit more people, but the ideas of what works to recruit vary sharply by class. So um, working class activists answered that question talking about what, what new recruits would get um, by joining. So selective incentives is a term for member-only benefits, but it can also mean things like food, having food at meetings, um, having entertainment at um, big events. Um, having mutual aid and kinds of, of help that you only get if you're a member. Um, and then an another aspect of this is they thought that people would join um, if there was a realistic plan for short-term victories on, on some, um, some sub-issue that would actually improve the lives of the, of the people being recruited. So giving people a, a, a realistic sense of hope. Um, by contrast, the college-educated activists, um, when they were answered that question about what would get more people to come, by talking about issues, what issue appeals to who, how to adjust the political ideas um, to recruit. Um, and at the uh, meetings, the, the majority college-educated um, meetings, there were more discussions of options of framing issues and choosing sub-issues. Um, and I found that um, at the the majority college educated um, meetings, there, there was often um, food and other short term incentives were overlooked. For example, the, at several um, college educated majority groups, meeting at six o'clock at night with no food in the room, saying, How are we going to get more people to turn out? And I think that's a perfect example of if they had had more exposure 
to working class majority groups um, that the idea of, of serving food might have occurred to them as something that might get people to come to the meetings. Um, there was a particular difference um, with the voluntarily downwardly mobile um, anarchists of expecting the um, ideology to be what drew kindred spirits. And um, some of the um, people in that subculture actually opposed recruiting. So I have a quote here from a young white um, anarchist who said, um, we're not a recruiting organization. I want people to associate with us because they feel similar. We don't want to evangelize. So like all these other forces, religion, politics. Um, so recruits, that's why I said recruiting was almost universally a goal. There were some people who actually felt like it was a wrong thing to do. You should wait for people to affiliate with you. So one of the most obvious differences that I just leapt out at me when I listened to the audio um, of, of the interviews and the meetings was how differently activists of different classes talked. Um, one thing is a humor difference that um, the working class majority meetings had more um, teasing, more negative humor of all kinds, self-deprecating, teasing others, and uh, wrote snafu there for pointing out ways that the situation was all messed up at the, um, in the organization and laughing about that. Um, and the other real obvious difference is that working class activists used more concrete, specific language, like names, places, events. Um, and that was not just a vocabulary difference, but um, actually a preference for styles of speech. Um, in explaining complicated political ideas, like their goal and their strategies, they're more likely to use storytelling and metaphors and analogies. What I mean by analogies is things like, say you and I were friends and we had a conflict, or say you were in the hospital. So making an analogy to the political situation. And um, a lot of the metaphors were familiar um, or cliches, but um, here's an example of someone um, coining, I'm a pebble in their shoe. So very vivid kind of speech. Um, the college educated activists um, had, were different about humor. Uh, there was, they did do some of that um, snafu and self-deprecating humor, but there seemed to be a teasing taboo among a subset of them, particularly white professional women um, who thought that uh, negative humor directed at other people was like bullying or, or being mean. And so um, there was uh, a lot less of that. Um, and there was more wordplay, like laughing at puns and things like that. Um, and then, um, not surprisingly for people who've gone to college, there uh, were more abstract generalizations in their speech. So, um, for example, um, I, I did word counts of the kinds of words that um, uh, people of each class, background, each trajectory used how often per 10,000 words. Um, and um, it's not that working class people didn't use these words ever, but they were used much more often by um, college educated activists. So things like strategy, principle, connection, perspective, and then a lot of the ideological words, oppression and solidarity. Man, that one just like kind of broke my heart because that's like the rallying cry of the labor movement all over the world, 14 times as often it appears in the college educated activist speech um, than it, in, among working class and poor interviewees. Um, so two other word lists, um, words used more often by professional, lifelong professional middle class activists than by working class activists. And then the voluntarily downward be mobile, having um, the lingo, that anarchist lingo, like autonomous and hierarchy and consensus. Um, so um, luckily, most of the organizational and strategy and tactic topics that you need to talk about to have an, an activist group, there were terms that were used by activists of all classes. Um, and here's some of those, those terms. Um, so it was not that people couldn't communicate or had completely non-overlapping vocabularies, but um, I'm going to tell you a story of how this was somewhat problematic. Um, it, it wasn't really a class conflict about different language, or it wasn't that people didn't understand each other. Um, but um, so in this story, 
Zoe was um, brought in as an outside facilitator by a labor-initiated coalition uh, for their annual goal-setting meeting. And here's a sentence that Zoe said, that's a whole big category of developing a plan in order to achieve a number of these goals. A sentence like that with no concrete reference like names or places or events, I basically never heard that from a lifelong working class or, or poor person. Um, and so when she gave the instructions to the small groups um, that were supposed to give input into the annual goals, she used a number of terms that then none of the union members used the terms in their report backs. So benchmark, mobilization, strategic process. She was just using a lingo that wasn't in their habitual vocabulary. In their, in their report backs, they instead talked about political issues like health care, access to health insurance, and they made concrete suggestions. Like one said, let's call Al to see if he has a firefighter's retiree list. So you can just see how this is two different ways of using speech, um, both for the same politically progressive goals. And at the end of the meeting, um, well, Zoe and some professional middle class union leaders expressed frustration that they didn't get the input into the goals that they wanted. So these, these different speech um, codes were getting in the way. Um, that not, it's not that they didn't get along, but they were talking past each other a lot. So, so far I've just been talking about class culture differences um, where there wasn't per, uh, class culture conflict. But um, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a third and final example of um, a class culture difference um, between working class and college educated activists, where it really did sometimes come up in the form of conflict. So um, I'm going to tell you a story um, that some of you may, may have even been there in that picture, that big crowd you see on the screen. So in New York City, um, as in so many cities around the globe, um, May 1st is a big um, workers holiday and there's a, there's a rally and march every year in New York City. And in 2012, there was a lot of excitement about the potential for it being bigger than in, in other recent years um, because Occupy Wall Street had started the prior fall and um, they, uh, in Occupy Wall Street endorsed the May Day Coalition. Um, so um, I heard a panel at, at the Working Class Studies Conference with four people who had been on the planning committee and um, had worked with each other and um, with all the groups involved in this coalition. It was one person from an immigrant group, because of course it's a big immigrant holiday. Um, uh, it's uh, 2006, there were enormous immigrant rights um, rallies on May Day. Um, one was um, from a service workers union. Um, one was a leftist from a longtime um, group in New York that has often always sponsored um, May Day. And then one person was from Occupy Wall Street. So this is a panel of four people. So and they, were all, they all told this story, um, which had a good ending because, as you can see, it was an enormous rally. But the person from the um, union said, the planning process was full of tension and conflict. It was really, really frustrating. Um, and she said, you'll never guess what was the touchy topic between the, um, the longtime May Day groups um, and the more working class groups and the Occupy Wall Street people. And because I had just done this research, I wrote on my notebook and nudged the, my friend sitting next to me and I said, She's going to say group process was what the, um, and she said, you'll never guess what it was. It was group process differences. That's what hung us up. That some of the Occupy Wall Street people um, wanted to um, decide, make every decision by consensus, even if it meant that the meetings went till two or three in the morning. But our members had to get up in the morning. They had to go home and talk kids in. Um, they couldn't meet every night, day after day after day, um, and there was, it was um, not, um, it was hard to get uh, an issue to be um, closed. And that they um, in, insisted on doing group process decision making their way. Like there couldn't be differentiation of um, 
some people as leaders of different aspects of the project, and some of them pushed particular um, kinds of group process, like the hand signals um, that were used at some of the Occupy uh, occupations. Um, and she said, it just plain drove us nuts. So I found that in um, some of that same attitude among working class activists, um, as well as some others who are not group process fans, elaborate group process fans. Um, and I found that the difference in the class difference in group process opinions has flows out of different concepts of leadership. So that's the last um, class culture difference I'm going to tell you about is how activists of different classes think differently about leadership. Working class and poor activists were much less anti-leadership. And now this, I do not want to feed into the stereotype of the quote unquote authoritarian working class personality. This does not mean that they were just following like sheep and doing what they were ordered. It was not, that was not the case by a long shot. Um, working class members were um, actively monitoring their leaders' actions were they acting for the community or against the community? And deciding to trust people, um, not by their talk, but by how they walk the walk of acting for the community. Um, working class majority groups were often a network of mutual aid, um, and there were um, the leaders were often the people who did the most protective acts, um, like um, taking a homeless member into their home or going to court to advocate for someone. Um, against a foreclosure, things like that. Um, and so, that, again, these are people who had proven through their actions um, that they were trustworthy and um, you know, good people to be connected to. Um, the leadership, the, there were very popular, strong leaders um, in the working class majority groups who had one-on-one -on -one relationships of mentoring and empowerment with the less active, more inexperienced members. So out of these leader actions um, came a loyalty to trustworthy leaders and that people's commitment to the group was inseparable from the loyalty to those trustworthy leaders and people voted with their feet there was a lot more turnover of working class and poor activists which was a problem um, but um, there was even the opinion expressed that you're not supposed to stay in a group if you're critical of the leaders if you're you know if you can't be loyal to this leadership then move on um, and um, in terms of leader behavior, um, there was not an unequal airspace of who talked how much um, was not raised as a big concern if there wasn't extreme overtalking. Uh, everybody likes, dislikes over, extreme overtalking, but equalizing airspace was not a big concern. So this is so different from the college educated activists, no matter what movement tradition they're in, no matter which tr class trajectory they are, um, leader is much more likely to have a negative connotation. And it's also much more common to stay in a, an activist group and criticize the, the leaders and criticize the group. And to some college educated activists, not everybody, but to some, equalizing power within the group and sharing the airspace is equally as important as reaching the external social change goals. And so it's any amount of time spent on that can seem really worthwhile. And so how they went about that equalizing of airspace, equalizing of power, um, they had two strategies. Um, one is to hold back from dominating people who were in dominant social identities, like white people, um, men, holding back from dominating. And this was especially true among the young white, voluntarily downwardly mobile activists. Um, the other strategy is seeing meeting facilitation as being the manager, promoting equal verbal participation. So setting up stylized group processes that require each person to participate equally. Um, and so this is, you can just see how different that is from the, the working class approach to leadership. Just really different connotations about what makes good leadership. So um, all these class cultures have strengths and limitations. I see something really worthwhile, something to keep in, in each of them. Um, but um, there are not that many um, class diverse groups, and they, um, those that do 
don't necessarily draw on the strengths of all class cultures. Um, so what would that look like if a group did? I'm showing a picture here from um, here in Boston. We have City Life, Vida Urbana, a very um, cross-class uh, role model, I think. Um, so you can have, a group can have where uh, members feel loyalty to each other and to the leaders and to the cause. Um, neither one has to be totally primary over the other. You can um, have support for trustworthy leadership, yet also um, have people stay in the group when they have criticisms and raise power and accountability issues. You can use vivid and accessible language um, and express ideas through um, storytelling. You don't have to fall into that, that thing they taught us all in college of flattening out our language. Those of us who went to those kind of colleges, they really get you to talk more and more abstract. Um, but you can introduce big ideas and big terms when they're useful for the, for the social change um, goals. Um, every group can use the methods of um, drawn from working class culture of serving food, having mutual aid, making sure you have some tangible wins in your plan and other kinds of selective incentives. And um, you can uh, innovative participatory group processes um, don't have to be imposed. They can be, not be imposed, but they can be cultivated together um, by uh, looking for the processes that everybody there likes. So I have seen a few um, in my research, in my activism, I've seen a few um, class diverse groups that mix these class cultures. Um, but that's not the norm. Most class progressive groups are not very class diverse. And so I have a challenge for you. Um, you're right now participating in um, one of a huge number of New Economy Week events. Uh, it's very, very exciting. They're, they're very juicy and, and varied. Um, but if you look through that website and look into the bios of the speakers, the conveners, the performers, ask yourself, how many of the voices, if you, if you were able to move, run around the country and participate in every New Economy Week event, how many people, how many speakers would you be hearing who don't have four-year degrees or don't have advanced degrees? How many speakers would you be hearing of, who have always worked working class jobs or have lived in poverty for a long time? I haven't done the math. I read a few bios. I know some of the speakers, um, really wonderful speakers with who are published authors, have advanced degrees. Um, but I suspect New Economy Week is not proportional to the US population as a whole. If it were, the speakers would be about over two thirds with um, less than a four year degree. One in six would be in poverty. A third would be renters, a third would be people of color. I don't think that's the situation. And I'm not trying to pick on New Economy Week. This is true of so many progressive media outlets, uh, conferences, organizations, um, publishers, everything, every, every means where you get to hear somebody's voice, every channel, um, you know, who has blogs, um, this is um, everywhere on the left that we're disproportionately hearing the voices of more class um, privileged people. And, and that's a problem. Um, so what can you do if you find yourself in a heavily college educated organization as uh, speaking as a college ed educated person with uh, an advanced degree now myself, um, I've been there. Um, one is to look around for what Linda Stout, um, who wrote Bridges Across the Class Divide, or Bridging the Class Divide, sorry, um, calls invisible walls. Um, are, is there any way, is there anything about your location, um, translation, childcare, is there any way you're limiting the access of working class and poor people, people with disabilities, et cetera, um, and taking down your invisible walls? Um, second, you can look around your organization for inessential weirdnesses. When people of different cultures and subcultures encounter each other, they often 
get weirded out. They often see something as somewhat weird, and that's just that just happens. And to some extent, it's inevitable. I was a community organizer for years and years, and I found people who had never met a non-Christian and couldn't understand why we wouldn't pray to Jesus at the beginning of every meeting when there's, you know, some of the um, organizers and um, people from nonprofits were Jewish and other minority religions. Um, so that's an essential, that's a, an, uh, a weirdness that's essential. You can't change it. People are just going to have to adjust to each other. And people do adjust to each other, of course. But if there's something about your language, your group process, your cultural norms, I think those hand signals are a perfect example, that might be alienating to some, pe some potential groups, people who agree with you on the broad issue. Just eliminate them. Take out as many inessential weirdnesses as you can and blend in with the culture of the people that you're trying to recruit across class lines. And the other is just not to ask, how can we become more diverse? Um, and this, I think, has been said many times by, um, by anti-racists about white groups that say, why don't they, meaning people of color, join us? Stop asking that. Learn about what's going on in the grassroots communities around you. Um, and find some working class and low income led community efforts and pitch in as allies. Walk some picket lines, raise some money, and form relationships that way. And then once you're working together on the issues that grassroots working class and poor people have identified, um, from there you'll be able to build collaborations that include um, the issues that you're most concerned about as well. So that's just three three tips um, for um, building cross-class alliances and more mixed-class um, groups. But to get more concrete about your next steps, um, we hope you'll all stay in close touch with class action. Um, we, if you want to keep thinking about class and all the ways that class um, comes up in our society and in your life, uh, we're happy to be uh, putting things into your Facebook feed. If you like us on Facebook, if you sign up for our e-newsletters, we'll let you know when we have new content. Um, we define class and classism very broadly, so all kinds of juicy topics. Um, we think that most organizations need to have some class conversations about who's who in the organization. Um, and so if you're interested in hosting a class action workshop, we've got a, ta a, click, a thing to click called Bring Class Action to You and a form where you can inquire about a class action workshop. Um, and we have a, a manual called Walking Across the Class Divide um, on our store um, that has uh, suggested um, topics and um, ways to conduct um, a conversation about class um, between people of different classes. And then um, next May, my book, Myths in Class, is going to come out. It has a lot more about activist class cultures. Um, I'm going to be going on book tour. I'd love to speak in your community. So if you can let me know where do, where do authors speak, where you live, um, I gave you my email there. And um, if you think this is important, that activist class cultures, um, if you're as convinced as I am that this is getting in the way of building the movements we want to build, um, connect with us and help us spread the word about social change and activist class cultures. And thank you for this opportunity to talk to all the wonderful people whose names I see scrolling on the screen here. It's really great to connect with you and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you so much, Betsy. Um, so yeah, we will take questions at this point. Um, Again, if you want to uh, ask a question, you can press that little hand button to raise your hand. Uh, and in the meantime, there are a couple of questions that have come through uh, that folks have typed in. Um, one person asked about uh, conferences, the idea that conferences are a, a paradigm of the educated class, uh, a form and structure, and, and asking, is it a form and structure that all classes would want to participate in? Um, how can we think outside the box about forms and structures that might make people feel a little bit more comfortable moving beyond a series of podium speakers, connecting with passive listening audiences, um, moving towards, I guess, more active engagement is what they're asking. Unmuted. 
That's a really great point. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of experiments, some at the social forums, um, and um, with um, using different formats, um, not necessarily calling it a conference, which does sound kind of academic, calling it something else, calling it a gathering. I think the, um, the organization that I've seen do the best job with that is the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force that has pre-gatherings for people of color, for youth, and at least one year that I know of for working class and poor people um, to get together and build a sense of community so that they can act as an organized block during the conference. Um, also, there's a lot of um, performance um, and art um, as the way that the ideas came out during the conference was very, very uh, varied in, in format. So um, yeah, I think um, call it something else and uh, do it differently. And it'll vary by um, community. Working class cultures are, are really diverse. And so um, you know, if, if the local low income people are Native American, then what's going to be the different way of doing a gathering is going to be really different than if you're in an, an urban setting. Um, and it's uh, maybe, you know, your low-income people are white Catholics. It's going to be a different thing. Um, so it's it's ethnically specific, geographically specific, urban rural specific. What what's the cultural comfort zone for working class and poor um, activists? Thanks, Betsy. I'm going to go to a question uh, from Cheryl Distazzo, I believe is your last name. Uh, Cheryl, are you there? I'm here. Great. Hi, Betsy. How are you? Can you hear me? Um, <laughs> hi, Cheryl. Really nice to hear your voice. Thanks. So, um, you know Thanks. that I'm doing my so, thesis um, research. So, you know that I'm doing my thesis research. I've got a weird echo going on. Um, about the, um, anti-poverty initiatives that utilize the Culture of Poverty Paradigm by Ruby Payne and Oscar Lewis. And um, one of the things that I'm just barely starting to look at is, is it ever okay to refer to um, a class as a culture? And how that is problematic from an anthropological perspective, because I think one of, one of the things that we're looking at now is that the term culture is used a lot more casually than it, than it was intended to be used. And in fact, the early um, Oscar Lewis critiques um, bring that out. Um, Ryan and, and, um, and Valentine bring that out. So I, and I want to talk to you about this more in depth later when I have a better question articulated. But has, did you, did you work out that whole, like, should I use culture and what's that going to do? And I mean, how did you come to the conclusion to actually use the term culture when you're looking at different classes? Sorry, Betsy, you're still muted. I just want to add one other question to that that came through over the line, which is about the sort of identifying these groups we're talking about. Um, someone asked, who in the U.S. identifies as working class? Is that a, is that a useful self-identification? I think it's a good question there. So I think these two are, are related. I'm muted. Yeah, they really are, um, they, they really are related because um, the, uh, the Marxist term is we, we don't have any uh, classes for themselves in this country, which by Marxist terms means we don't have any classes except for a ruling class because to be a class, you have to be organized um, and have class consciousness and be able to act as a collective entity. Um, and um, people, when asked by pollsters, do more often than people think say they choose working class off a list. But it's not in um, it's not much of a self identity. Um, the class identities are at a very very low level, um, and um, so we have. We have classes in themselves, but not for themselves. So um, I'm really excited about your research, Cheryl. I can't wait to read it. Um, if if um, anyone else on the webinar hasn't been following the um, the really really classist way of thinking about um, class culture differences that Ruby Payne is making millions of dollars promulgating to school systems all over the United States, 
um, the thing to Google to hear, uh, or go to YouTube actually, and see Paul Gorski, G-O-R-S-K-I, um, do Paul Gorski Ruby Payne, P-A-Y-N-E. He's he wrote a wonderful article debunking this so um, uh, this very stereotyped definition of um, what are the cultural differences among classes. And the one way I would uh, you know make a very sharp distinction between my um, generalizations and you know, maybe they are over generalizations, but and Ruby Payne's is the the voices that are in her books and workbooks that are supposed to be, quote unquote, the poor culture, those quotes were written by Ruby Payne, who's a middle class white woman, and she does this fake black dialect that's just so offensive. Um, so that, um, that I, um, I am uh, accurately conveying voices of actual working class and poor activists as well as activists of other classes. I'm quoting people, I'm, say, I'm, I'm hearing people's um, uh, own ideas, opinions, behaviors um, from actual um, conversations um, and observations. So um, that's one thing. But, um, but you're asking something more specific, which is why use this word culture? Um, this is, um, there's a wonderful network um, that I referred to, the Working Class Studies Network, that's had conferences for um, I, getting close to 20 years, I think, um, and there's going to be one in June um, in um, Long Island, on Long Island. Um, and within Working Class Studies, um, there's a lot of people who look at workplaces and look at the economy, of course, but the subset of um, working class studies that um, looks at things like speech codes and things like different um, predispositions towards ways of problem solving and um, differences in, in families and relationships and things um, in class and everyday life. The shorthand within working class studies is, is class cultures. So I know the word culture can mean so many things. I got kind of a crash course over in the last few years on cultural sociology, um, which is a really, um, it's a wonderful um, field for giving you ways to approach any, any social group. And um, so I, I'm thinking of the word culture um, in that very, very broad sense. But um, I agree with you that, um, it's, there, there definitely are problematic things about saying there are class cultures in the US. Um, all parts of that need to be unpacked and there probably are people who would disagree with using that class cultures phrase who I would see the sense in their disagreement, perhaps even with you, Cheryl. So. Thanks, Betsy. Uh, a quicker question that um, Eric Walker has posed a couple of different ways um, is around the, your survey methodology and, and evaluative tools um, for, for getting into these questions, trying to get a sense of who is in your organization uh, and, and what, are the, what are the divides that, that are really there. So you're saying within, say you're a member of an organization and you want to find out um, what are the class backgrounds. Um, I wouldn't recommend self-surveying. Um, most people don't have, either don't have a self-identity by class at all, or we use vocabulary really differently. Like people use the term middle class to mean at least a dozen different things. So, um, and also it's a really, it can be a really touchy topic that can raise a lot of emotions. One thing I've learned through doing um, all these um, class action workshops with so many um, organizations and, and groups is that um, in any given gathering of people, there are class secrets in the room. And there are people who have not revealed to others their some hardships that they or their family have lived through or some privileges, inheritance, or um, something um, on the high class privileged end of things. Um, and it's going to be emotional. 
to bring those secrets forward. Um, so um, class action has developed a number of, um, of things in the popular education tradition where you do participatory workshops, you take some time, you have an experience together or you share your life experience and you have space to debrief and you uh, ideally an outside facilitator who's, um, who can help with the, the debrief that um, it can be kind of fraught to, to bring the realities. I found that most people guess wrong about who's who in um, activist groups um, and uh, in particular the part of, of um, poor people is being played by people of, of every class. Um, there's a lot of um, shame in on the left in uh, admitting to privilege. Sometimes it's a embarrassing thing to admit, and there's a lot of posing. Um, anyway, so it's, it's so so often you're unpacking layers of difficult things, um, and it's a process. Give it time. If your organization has done some diversity work, um, for example. Um, you've had um, anti-racist uh, workshops um, or uh, outside facilitators to deal with um, race dynamics and, and how your organization can be anti-racist, um, you probably moved farther faster with that because at the beginning of the process, probably most people were in rough agreement about who was who by race. Um, there might be some misunderstandings, um, but, um, and that uh, race, um, you know, there's some common vocabulary um, for ethnic groups. With class, you're starting at a more basic level. Not always. Um, I've got, ran into a few people who are taught class all the time, but um, often you're, you're, you need to start at that level of, well, what is class? What is classism? What are some definitions we can agree on, some vocabulary we can agree on for describing the different class experiences? Um, and then um, in class action workshops, we move uh, from that to learning from the strengths of all class cultures, um, strengthening your organization's ability to meet its mission by drawing on the strengths of all class cultures and getting to the point of reducing the classism in your organization. Um, and by the end of the workshop or the series of workshops or whatever. So, um, yeah, the, uh, I, I'm a little humbled by seeing how how many steps there are involved. So uh, we've got a question from either Anna or Anna. I'm sorry, but uh, are you are you there? Uh, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I, I had a question, uh, something that I'm struggling with, um, you know, I, I definitely understood, uh, sort of empathized, you're describing the groups that come from um, an educated background and that um, trained instinct of holding back and, you know, trying to create voice for everyone and that balance I really can relate to and I also working in my community, um, I understand the value of leadership and a place where I struggle is, um, you know, if, if, if I um, have an ability or an interest or desire to galvanize and bring groups together and create and offer um, my services as, you know, able to organize, but I also, you know, that struggle of Leadership, you know, you talk about the working class being um, okay with people taking leadership, but then um, because of race differences, I might not be the right leader. I struggle. Do I step up in leadership or do I support others in stepping up that are of, you know, of different races and who is stepping up and how do people feel about supporting, you know, a leader? So, you know, a Hispanic leader of a white working class group, a white leader um, in, a, in a black neighborhood, in a, you know, how have you seen that work out um, in supporting diversity or, or pushing diversity down and building divides? Is it possible, I guess, is that question. 
Great. Betsy, I'm going to turn it over to you. Just a, a time check. It is three right now. Um, I mean, anybody can drop off the call except for you. So I'm wondering what your uh, time constraints are. Um, yeah, I can, I, can, I can go for a little longer, Mike, like another 10 minutes or something. So I can stay on. Sure, sounds good. I think that's a really great question. Um, and I've been in that situation. And um, I know I, I would say that to your last question, is it possible? Um, yes, it is. Um, that I think um, if your focus in, in taking leadership, um, whoever you are, um, but especially in those tricky, tricky situations where you're in a more privileged group, um, taking leadership with a constituency um, that's marginalized in some on some uh, identity, um, just making sure that the focus of your leadership is empowering others and leadership development. Um, and yes, it would be ideal if um, it was always someone from the community um, who were, was doing that. Um, that's it's great. Often that is happening. But I saw very effective, um, you know, upper middle class, white, straight guys, middle aged, everything, you know, dominant on every identity, um, ha being these wildly popular leaders of um, grassroots majority working class groups because everything they did um, was um, to get people to step up and get more involved. Um, and to build skills and um, keep getting people into more um, more roles so that they could become more of a leader. I, I ended up, you know, um, I've known the Midwest Academy methodology, um, you know, the, the, um, uh, the, the um, book called The Bible of Community Organizing, it's called Organizing for Social Change, um, Kim Bobo and everyone. I've known that methodology, been trained in it, um, been an organizer, in it, and um, I wasn't specifically going to test it in my research, but I kept finding that I was I was ending up with some of the same conclusions. So if you haven't been um, a community organizer or a labor organizer, um, and especially if you're working across differences like that, I really recommend get, uh, getting that book or getting trained by um, an. Uh, Industrial Areas Foundation group or a, a near you or a by the Midwest Academy themselves, because those methods really do work. Of, so find a winnable victory that will give people hope and have an immediate impact on their lives so that they feel like, oh, involvement in this group really pays off. And um, you know, listen to the community for what the concerns are, for what that should be. Create tiny roles. The person who's too shy to even say a word, maybe they can bring the cookies, you know? And after they've done that for a while, maybe they can read the minutes and, you know, just stepping up. And that I, I had these wonderful testimonials um, among the, um, the longtime um, impoverished activists that I interviewed, some from like welfare rights groups, who talked about who they, how they became empowered. And it, 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 I ended up being a really big believer in that Midwest Academy um, methodology because uh, I heard from the people that it had worked for, um, who are now, you know, playing very active roles, speaking in public, organizing other people. Um, so yeah, it can work. And I would say, don't hold back out of, uh, I'm not saying never hold back, like sometimes if you talk too much, you should talk less, but, um, but don't um, sit around waiting for a better, um, potential leader to come along. There's an infinite range. There's room for everybody to be leaders. And you're needed because a lot more is needed. We're all needed. Um, and and dive in, make mistakes, and um, build relationships um, across class and race. And do whatever you can think of to help people grow in their own leadership. And um, you'll end up making a positive difference. Even you also have some tricky things you have to process with people at times. You stepped on their toes. Uh, Betsy, I think that's a, a pretty good place to wrap up. We have one more question that came through um, that I want to make sure gets 
answered. It's, and it's about um, faith communities and churches um, that have had successful uh, programs, successful uh, success at, at raising a dialogue around class. Um, so maybe we want to take that one and then wrap up. And thank you so much. This has been terrific. I think there's, we've, uh, from the perspective of the, the New Economy Coalition, have, have gotten a lot of really great insights into how we can be uh, better organizers. So really appreciate you doing this. I'm muted. Good. I'm happy to hear that. And I, I feel really excited to be talking to all of you, too. It's, it, this is just such a wonderful opportunity. Um, so faith organizations, well, first, the one that I just mentioned, the Industrial Areas Foundation, there are um, faith-based uh, community groups um, under that umbrella in many parts of the country. Um, and um, I, I think that in some places they've been very successful at being mixed class, of having the, the suburban churches and synagogues and mosques and everybody and with the urban and um, low income, um, not always. But, um, and um, another, another success was early on in the environmental justice movement where so much leadership was taken by the United Church of Christ. Um, so, um, and I think that the, um, what's the name? Some of you probably know that Jim Wallace, um, um, there's a, an evangelical take care of the earth effort um, that has been really successful in getting some of the, um, the, the religious denominations that usually don't get involved in progressive causes involved on, like, on the name of it. Um, I'm part of um, Class Action is working with um, some Unitarian Universalists to create um, UU-specific uh, cross-class dialogue workshops. Um, and there seems to be a wave, actually, of UUs raising up class within their um, denomination. So I think often um, faith-based organizations are, are, are where the action is in terms of actively struggling with how do you do your social justice work um, not in a class segregated way since religious congregations by them, most of them are class segregated and but there's a lot of progressives who are struggling against that and so some of the most creative thinking about um, forming cross-class alliances is coming out of um, faith-based uh, organizations So uh, that's about the time that we have. Um, Betsy, do you have any, any uh, final thoughts before we log off? No, just um, that uh, I hope this is the beginning of a conversation with some of you all and um, that you asked really juicy questions that I'd be happy to keep talking about and that uh, I hope to, I hope that um, We'll stay connected through some of those memes that you see on my last slide. Um, uh, please get in touch and let's let's talk class. Let's talk crossing class and um, let's let this be the beginning of a conversation. Hey Amen. Thank you all so much. Uh, happy New Economy Week. It's uh, we're still going for a few more days. If you haven't checked it out, the map neweconomyweek.org. There are all sorts of exciting events in your area. Uh, and who knows, maybe you can show up and, and shake things up and ask some, some important questions about classism. And uh, thank you so much, Betsy. This has, been, this has been really a treat. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us.